Good evening. My name is William Harris. I'm president and CEO here at Space Center Houston. I'm delighted to welcome you here for our thought leader program. We have a very special this program, program this evening featuring a conversation with Mark Geyer, uh, the newly appointed director of NASA Johnson Space Center. Uh, through this series, we engage space exploration leaders in stimulating discussion and provide you with an opportunity to participate in the conversation. Space Center Houston strives to create a community of problem solvers and fuel the STEM pathway to advance a science and engineering literate community and society. We are the official visitor center for NASA Johnson Space Center and also a Smithsonian affiliate. And that enables us to bring to the public current and historic information on space exploration and artifacts from the National Collection. You've seen a few pre-programmed slides before we get underway this evening about the many programs and activities here at Space Center Houston, and we really invite you to become involved. You could consider becoming a member to our Science and Space Exploration Learning Center and join our many fun learning experiences. As a nonprofit, your participation supports our education programs and is tax deductible. Uh, you can find out additional information on our website at www.spacecenter.org. We're quickly approaching NASA's 60th birthday on October 1st, and the countdown's underway for the 50th anniversary of the historic Apollo 11 mission to the moon in July of 2019. In celebration of these and many more achievements in space exploration, Space Center Houston is kicking off more than a year of exciting events. A special note, we'll have a fall luncheon on October 23rd called To the Moon and Beyond, where we're going to recognize um, a well-regarded and, and uh, a great friend to Space Center Houston, uh, former Apollo flight director, Gene Kranz. All proceeds from the lunch are going to benefit our $5 million campaign to restore the Apollo uh, Mission Control Room at NASA Johnson Space Center. And Gene's also gonna share his experiences um, and really is wanting to help us preserve this incredible historic landmark in our own backyard. Uh, we'll have more information about the event outside and you can also find it on our website. So this evening, I am absolutely thrilled to welcome Mark Geyer. Mark is the 12th director of NASA's Johnson Space Center, a position he assumed on May 25th of 2018. In this role, he leads a workforce of approximately 10,000 civil servant and contractor employees at one of NASA's largest installations. And it also, he also oversees the White Sands Test Facility in Las Cruces, Mexico. Mark began his career in 1990 at NASA Johnson Space Center in the new business directorate. He joined the International Space Station program in 1994, where he served a variety of roles until 2005, including chair of the Space Station Mission Management Team, manager of the ISS Integration Program Office, and NASA lead negotiator with Russia on space station requirements plans, and strategies. From 2005 to 7, Mark served as Deputy Program Manager on the Constellation Program before transitioning to Manager of the Orion Program, a position he held until 2015. Under Mark's direction, Orion was successfully tested in space in 2014 for the first time, bringing NASA another step closer to sending astronauts to deep space destinations. After supporting Orion, Mark served as Deputy Center Director at NASA Johnson Space Center until September 2017. In this role, he helped the Center Director manage a broad range of human spaceflight activities, including the Center's annual budget of approximately $5.1 billion. From October 2017 to May 2018, he served as the Acting Deputy Associate Administrator for Technical for the Human Explorations and Operations Mission Directorate at NASA headquarters in Washington. That is a mouthful. <laughs> in this position, he was responsible for assisting the associate administrator in providing strategic direction for all aspects of NASA's human spaceflight exploration mission. So a little more background about Mark. He was born in Indianapolis. He earned both his bachelor in science, bachelor of science and master of science degrees in aeronautical and astronomical engineering from Purdue University. Uh, he's the recipient of the NASA Distinguished Service Medal, Meritorious Executive Rank Award, and the Distinguished Executive Rank Award. Mark, we're so delighted to have you here. He's going to make a few brief remarks uh, before I begin our, our conversation. I'm going to ask Mark a, a series of questions after that, but we invite all of you to send your questions in. We do this electronically so we can pick it up online. This uh, session is being 
broadcast live and you'll be able to watch it online after this evening. So you can email your questions to thoughtleaders at spacecenter.org and that email address will appear, should appear behind us in just a moment. So everyone, please join me in welcoming Mark Geyer. Got used to the seat first. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's actually comfortable. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it is. So Mark, please tell us a little bit about John, what is what is what is currently happening at NASA Johnson Space Center and what are what are some of your visions and aspirations in your new role as a center director? Well, thank thanks William and thanks for inviting me here. I appreciate the opportunity to kind of talk a little bit about JSC and what's happening um, and answer some questions about that. So, uh, we are really on the edge of becoming very much more visible, I would say, to the public because we are very close to launching crews again from the United States uh, to space station. And both. And the interesting thing is, not just one vehicle, but actually two. Both SpaceX and Boeing have the are going to have the capacity within the next year to fly crews uh, to the ISS from from Florida. And that's going to be a great uh, a chance for us. One again to get American companies flying back into space, but also increase the crew size and increase the utilization of the space station. That's gonna be a huge deal. And then within two years, we're gonna be flying Orion, uh, which is a spacecraft built from the beginning to fly into deep space out past the moon. Uh, and then a couple years after that, actually flying people out past the moon, things we haven't done since 1972. And so all these things are happening within the next two years. Uh, at this fly uh, to space station, which we've been doing since uh, for almost 20 years, actually 20 years this November. Uh, we've had people on board space station continuously now for 18 years. And we're starting the next phase. We're starting the program that gets us uh, actually to start utilizing the moon, uh, both with uh, really with what we call the gateway. And I can talk about a little bit of that later. We're starting that and one of the elements that's gonna be the first piece of the gateway is actually we put out a procurement uh, request and that element will actually fly in 22. So there's a ton going on right now. It's an exciting time to be at JSC. Uh, what we did when I came on board, I, I got the leadership team together and we said, okay, we have all this in front of us. What my, how do we kind of uh, prepare a vision that fits within NASA's vision and allows the, the JSC team to focus on the important stuff that we have in front of us? And we kind of broke, we did a lot of work on it and actually broke up our forward plan into three pieces. The first is, what we call achieving a mission, a mission tempo, which in, in uh, parlance of somebody who works space flight, it's getting back to being used to flying crews from the United States on a regular basis. If you were part of the shuttle program, you remember what that was like. Uh, we flew the last shuttle in 2011. So as I said, we're about to get back into that again with not one, but two companies. So are we ready to get to certification? Are we ready to support this flight cadence? Uh, so we're trying to make sure we line up and. The bosses do everything they can to make sure that the team is ready to do that. The second part is really thinking about uh, shaping the future. How does Johnson participate and, and lead uh, thinking about how to do this lunar system, this lunar environment in a more effective, efficient, sustainable manner? How do we use the partners and, and partner with the people we have, both international and commercial, to enable a system that is sustainable? And the third part is, is about us. How do we enhance our value going forward? What is the job NASA needs to do? And what is the job other people can do? And it starts thinking about what NASA's role is and how, what that role might be in the future. So those are three big thrusts that we have at JSC. Um, our vision statement uh, pulls on that. We talk about, uh, we dare to expand our frontiers. And these can be frontiers, not just mission, but processes that we're used to. You know, are we pushing on making sure we think we're doing all the things that we need to do and why are we doing some of the things we've done in the past and that we unite with our partners to uh, accomplish bold missions. We have a lot of different partners, but we unite around common goals uh, and then we explore space for the benefit of humankind. So dare unite and explore the three words that we use uh, at the center to kind of evoke that response and the feeling of uh, pushing out into the future and how JSC is a key part of that for NASA. So. Great. Well, I think you have one of the coolest jobs, without, <laughs> without question. So I want to actually take us back a little bit in the conversation. What actually attracted you to work for NASA? 
How did it get onto your radar as a possible career path? So I was uh, like millions of kids, probably. I, I was born in 58, so I remember um, Gemini and Apollo programs. I remember uh, having my, my, one of my earliest memories was having my tonsils out, and I was in the room, hospital room, and before they wheeled me into surgery, there was a, a Gemini launch that hadn't yet launched, and I was very irritated that, uh, that I was going to miss it. Um, and I remember all the Apollo launches. I built all the models. My brother and I knew all the operations of how it all worked. And I, I watched the landing, Apollo 11, from the living room of our house in Boise, Idaho. And, and I used the um, fireplace utensils to pretend I was collecting lunar samples as Neil was on this. So that, that, was, a big, that was a big thing for me. It affected me. But I did, I did uh, you know, it, it wasn't something that I... For the rest of my life, I thought, or excuse me, my rest of my uh, young life, that I all that's all I thought about. I, I wanted to be a doctor at one time. I thought of maybe even being a lawyer at one time. Uh, in the end, I had an opportunity to go to Purdue. Uh, my dad went to Purdue. We moved back to Indiana. Um, it was in-state tuition, <laughs> so it's funny how that works out sometimes. And that's a great school for uh, engineering. And I studied in a building called the Grissom Building. And I did my thesis in a laboratory called Chaffee Hall. Um, and we, of course, we know Neil Armstrong went there. So Purdue has a, a, a lot of tradition and it kind of imprints you with that thought. And then I came out. I got out of, uh, of uh, Purdue. And I actually tried to be a co-op here, and they didn't pick me. I wasn't accepted, yes. So it was, uh, I went to a place called McDonnell Aircraft in St. Louis and did some great work there. And then I went out to California. Worked for Lockheed for six years, and then I had a friend who was working here, and he called me and told me they had some openings, and uh, I applied, and the rest is history. So it was kind of a circuitous path, but in the but at the beginning it was about watching Gemini and Apollo and all that. Well, it's really great to know there's not a linear path, right? It's like you have to continue to explore. So I'm curious along those lines, are there certain leadership principles that guide you that you still follow that that help you in the work that you do? Um. Leadership principles. I would say there's a there's a few that um, resonated with me when I followed leaders, and I and I think is uh, something that I try to emulate. I I am far from perfect. Um, I like to tell people when I give them advice. I I like to preface it by saying, you know, when I'm at my best, this is what I do because I'm never can always do everything the way I talk about it. But I think honesty is a big one. I think that's one that people remember if they believe they can trust you is a huge piece. So um, being honest, being straightforward with people is very important. And also I find that uh, um, people can tell if you have the mission in mind. In other words, if you have the project and the team as the first priority as opposed to yourself. I think people can tell right away. And I could tell leaders that were that way. So I find that's another one too, right? Believe in the mission and uh, prioritize the work to support the mission it really does make a difference. So I'm curious if you could give us an example of how either a significant experience that kind of reinforced that for you. Yeah, let's see. Boy, that's a good question. Reinforce the specific on maybe on the focus on the mission kind of question. So. Uh, I can think of one time, particularly when uh, my first supervisor job, I was just an engineer and I was in a group of engineers and we were all on the same softball team. And one day the boss says, I want you to be the task lead, which was a very awkward thing at the time uh, because all these other folks were my friends. They were, they were um, co-workers and peers. Um, and in the end, what, what I had to do was, uh, in the end, someone has to lead. In the end, you have to set a priority. In the end, you have to make choices. So listening to the team was a big part of that. Um, and, and putting the task plan together so that the, that the team could succeed uh, and making those choices early. So that was, I think, my first example of, okay, here's what, it, here's what it's like to lead. Um, and even through things that can be difficult, someone needs to take charge and move forward. 
But leadership is a really important quality to develop. And clearly you have, were there mentors that helped you along your, your professional journey? Um, I had a, I've had a few. I think the first was my dad. Um, I think it's hard to overemphasize how much impact uh, a father or mother can have on a person as they're growing up and thinking about their career. My dad was a very successful um, manager. He, he was not in aerospace. He actually was a salesman for uh, sold ball bearings and eventually was in manufactured housing. Um, he was just a, a great salesman and a, and, a, and a leader of people. So I saw, again, the honesty. I saw the planning. I saw the reaction of people that worked with him who followed him across the country because they trusted him. And he had set a good, uh, a good model for how to lead people. Uh, and then at NASA, uh, there was a, a person that I worked with in Space Station who came in when, when really Space Station was in trouble. When I say trouble, we had already flown, but we were over budget. And there was a big uh, flap about how much over budget and whose fault it was. And uh, Tommy Holloway was the boss at the time. He actually came in rather, rather late, so he didn't really create most of the issues that were there before. But uh, what I remember about Tommy was he, he uh, stood up, he took, he took uh, the job as a leader, he took all the slings and arrows that all the independent folks came in with, um, but stood up for the team, uh, told the truth, uh, and led us through that difficult time. In the end, he, did, uh, he, did, uh, he was asked to retire. It was a very difficult time. But what I saw was a, a, a person that's willing to put there themselves uh, and to take the heat for the team. And he did a great job. So I'll never forget that. Wow. Well, knowing what you know now, what would you tell your younger self if you could step back 20 years along your career path? Yeah, that's an interesting one. Uh, I would, two things I would tell myself. I would party less. <laughs> And that's not because I have 20-year-old sons, but I, I think I would actually. And I don't mean, I think, it's, I think when you're in college, enjoying college life is a very important part of it. Uh, you, I mean, it'll be over before you know it. So enjoying college life is very important. I just wouldn't go as many bars. <laughs> Maybe just say that. Um, uh, that was a big one. And I would say also, just on a personal note, I think uh, in the middle of college, it's a very complex time in your life, I would, uh, if, it were, if I could go talk to myself, I would talk about staying more connected to my higher power during that period, because it's a stressful time, and, and I think that connection to God, however you, uh, your understanding, is very important at that time, and I, I would, uh, that's something I would go back and emphasize. So I'm curious, um, so many people want to work for NASA, and what, would you, what advice would you give to someone who aspires to work for NASA and be part of the Space Exploration Program? Well, uh, one, it's a great, uh, great choice. So I want to I agree with them. That'd be a terrific, it's a terrific place to work. I would say, uh, one, follow your passion. Um, if you have a passion for something, then you're much more likely to succeed in the, in the studying and the in the hard, uh, the number of hours and the difficult things you're going to have to get through to get through a, a degree that that is used at NASA. So find your passion. If you follow your passion, that excitement will get you through the the, the hard times. And then uh, talk to other people. That you know, there are a lot of folks that work at NASA that are very willing and open to uh, to answer your questions about what it's like to work here, uh, what kind of jobs we have at NASA because we have a lot of different kind of jobs. You know, we often Look at the astronauts or the or the PhDs. And engineering is an obvious one, but we have a lot of a lot of jobs, as as was described at the um, the women in leadership one you talked about. Right, we had accountants, we have uh, human uh, or HR specialists, we have uh, IT specialists. So there's a lot of different skills that are needed here at NASA. So again, follow your passion and and ask ask the kind of things of what it takes uh, and what people have gotten through to to get to NASA. And don't give up when they tell you, you you're not a co-op. Don't give up. You can <laughs> still work. Well, Mark, having worked with you on a couple of projects, I always admire how you always are really positive and driven and really focused on, on getting it done and, and really coming out with the best outcome. And I'm kind of curious, from where do you draw inspiration? Uh, well, 
I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I find that, uh, first of all, uh, life is bigger than any job, even a great job at working at NASA. Life is bigger than that. So I think being positive, uh, looking for, looking toward the future is just a strategy that's worked for me, right? It's just a very, uh, can be, it's, it's the way to uplift. It also helps if people are following you, they want a positive vision. They want, uh, they want a positive future, and I think it helps people. People are more likely to follow leaders who are that way. But I've just, it just seems to, I guess I've been blessed. I feel that that's, uh, that's just the way I feel about life. You know, I feel while well, there'll be challenges and ups and downs, that in the end, um, it's going to end in a positive way. And, and I've been blessed to work at NASA. That's certainly been the case. Well, something I admire about you is your communication style. And so I'm kind of curious, is that something you've cultivated over time, or how would you characterize the way you like to communicate to people? Um, I don't know. You know, I actually wasn't very good at it at first. I found it, it was something that I wanted to be good at because I like, I like being in leadership positions. I, I feel like... Uh, uh, that's something that, that that's a passion of mine, and I learned early that you need to be a good speaker to do that. I remember uh, running for uh, a senior class president in high school, and I practiced that speech for, I think, 10 hours, just walking up and down the driveway for three days until it flowed the way I wanted it to flow. Anyway, so I learned that you, if you want to be good, uh, really good at delivering a, a, a clear message, you have to work at it. It's just like anything else. It takes practice. So now, now it comes more. Uh, it comes a little easier after you know forty years of doing that kind of thing. Um, uh, it comes a little easier, but just like anything else, it takes it takes work. It takes practice. So I'm curious, what do you consider to be the biggest risk you've taken in your career? Um, biggest risk. So what would be classified as a risk? I've been blessed that none of my job choices were physically risky. Um, you know, and a lot, and, uh, other than getting on a plane, right, uh, to go to Washington. Uh, so what would, be phys what would be risky would be you make a career choice that in the end might not put you on a, a good path. In other words, you might end up in a job you don't like. So I... Um, I think it was January of 2005, my center director, um, General Howell at the time, called me in his office and said, I would really like you to go to Washington and work for this new program. And I said, well, I would rather not really because I have a good job here and my kids are little and I'd rather not, I'd rather not go. And he, he looked at me <laughs> pretty, pretty sternly. He said, well, I won't tell you to go, but I'd really like you to go. So. In the end, I, I went home and I talked to my wife and I said, I think my boss really wants me to go to DC. Uh, and we agreed we would do it because obviously that was a big choice for her too. Um, the kids were little. Uh, we had been here a long time and we didn't really know anybody in DC. So we made, that, we made a decision to go together and I, I went to Washington. I, um, it was, I worked for a guy named Admiral Steidel who was the head of exploration. In, this was when the previous, or the uh, George W. put out the exploration initiative, and Admiral Steidel was in charge of that at NASA, and they were looking for people to come to Washington. And uh, so I went. Um, I enjoyed my time there, but I was there maybe four months, and Mike Griffin showed up, who was the new administrator, and Mike changed the plan. And so I'm in Washington with no job. <laughs> and uh, but, you know, in the end, I, I, I uh, frankly, I, I felt like there was still going to be a lot of good work to do, and I felt like uh, I could contribute, and in the end, Mike asked me to come back to Houston to be the deputy of Constellation. So in the end, it worked out great, and I met a lot of people in Washington in my time there that helped me a lot in the future. I'd made a lot of connections, a lot of personal relations with people in Washington. So when I got back to Houston, I knew a lot of people up there, which helped me do, do my job a lot better. So it was a risk, um, but it definitely, I definitely, I would do it again. It was, uh, I learned a bunch 
even though at there's a time there I thought well, I wasn't sure what I was going to be doing. So that was a big one. So I'm curious, how have you prepared to take on more challenging roles? Well, first, let's see. How do I take? How do I take them on? Uh, to, for, the first thing I would say is one: uh, I don't like to take on challenging roles just to take on a challenging role. Um, I'm looking for challenging roles that are exciting, exciting that look like there's a path on this particular job that will do something really fun uh, and uh, something I haven't done before. So if that's the case, then I'm then I'm ready to jump on board. I did something. I actually kind of, uh, uh, I found that to do increasing exciting leadership jobs, you have to take chances. You have to take chances, you have to take tough jobs, and you have to work them hard and actually succeed, and then you get a lot more opportunities. That's been my experience too. So uh, now, how do you decide that you're ready, and how do you decide to take on more work? I've kind of come to a, uh, uh, thought with myself about there's so much I'm willing to sacrifice for a particular job. So I usually I have a chance, I take a look at the job and then I take a look at the folks that are gonna be supporting that. And then the next thing to do is get the right team, get the right team around you. If you get the right team around you, you can do just about anything. So that's usually my approach. But. I have another question, because you sort of touched on this a little bit about how, did you, how have you maintained life work balance? Because it's really clear you're Family is a priority to yours, but then you have these incredible career opportunities, some of them that you're compelled to move into. So what are some of the, the strategies or practices you've applied to maintain that work-life balance? Yeah, first thing I would say is a, a work-life work balance thing is not something you do once in your life, like when you're 12 and after that you never check in on it again. Um, it's something that's good to do very often, to check in with yourself very often. Um, for me, it can things can change pretty quickly, because uh, in the end, uh, this is this can be an awesome job. But when I retire, I'll probably have a few friends that will have breakfast together. But most people will go, "Who's that? Port Who's that guy that, that used to be the center director? Uh, and what was his name?" Um, so the most important thing to me is the family, because the family continues beyond the job. And I, I've been blessed with an incredible wife and three three great kids. And they will, uh, and they'll, they suffer my really bad jokes and my uh, incessant rooting for the Cardinals, where other people would not do that unless I was the boss. So, so it's good to balance that. And what I've found in a couple of cases is, uh, um, though, to have a really interesting job, you do have to make sacrifices. Uh, you, you can't be the center director and work eight hours a day and never travel, right? It's just not going to happen. Uh, so you have to make sacrifices to get a job like this. So my experience is to continue to balance that, to continue to have conversations, especially with your, if you have a significant other, uh, and see what, what is up actually up with the family at that time. You know, when I went to Moscow, I see some friends here who worked with that with me. When we went, I joined Space Station in 94. And when we flew FGB, I had... My wife and I had, sorry. We had a five-year-old, a 15-month-old, and a seven-month-old. No, hang on, that's not right. 22-month-old and a seven-month-old. That that's how young the kids were when I was going to Moscow, about every month. Um, and that was a very difficult, very difficult three years. And at the end, about a year after that, I stopped doing that, right? I had to find another way to get to... Uh, do a different job and still support the family. So I think that's just an example of, um, you know, take the tough jobs, but continue to check on those things because in the end, your family is going to be the most important thing. Well, you see, oversee a really large workforce at NASA Johnson Space Center between civil servants and contractors. I know that diversity, equity, inclusion, accessibility are important to you. So I'm curious, how do you advance that practice or best practices in that way at NASA Johnson Space Center, and why is it important to you? Yeah, great question on diversity inclusion and how is it important for, for JSC and for NASA. I think, to me, the main thing with diversity and inclusion is to take it from a concept, 
where all of us would go, oh yeah, that's a really good thing, and turn it into actually something in the front of my brain where it's actually something I think about on a day-to-day -day basis and how it affects my behavior. Uh, because I frankly have learned a lot in the last three, four years about this subject that I admit I was pretty clueless about in the past. And why was I clueless? Because I did not have, it did not affect me. Uh, in my entire career, uh, I had great opportunities. I had mentors uh, that looked like me, uh, that behaved like me. Uh, and I was able to advance to, you know, uh, great jobs. It wasn't until a few years ago as a leader at JSC that I became more aware, more aware. Uh, you, you, you would say, well, geez, I think that's obvious. But uh, it wasn't until about that time that I started thinking more deeply about the fact that to really have the strongest overall team, I need to be thinking about what about the folks that don't have those advantages that I had that I never had to think about before. And a good example of that would be uh, I had a privilege that, as I said, I had mentors at every level at JSC that were very much like me. But if I was in a certain demographic, that would not be true. Uh, so it was very easy for me to find mentors. It was very easy for me to communicate with folks in higher up leaderships and others in other demographics would not have that advantage. So given that that's true, and I find this is a very subtle thing, a very subtle thing. So as a leader, while I'm not to blame for what happened in the past, I'm responsible for thinking about the future. And I need to be thinking about for other folks how do we set up a system? How do we set up our processes so that everyone uh, can, has an opportunity, the same ex opportunities and a chances to succeed that I do? And uh, here's, a, here's an example that I used in an all hands that we did. When I came into my first job, which was at Lockheed out on the West Coast, I came in as one of nine people that got hired about the same time. Uh, eight of us were guys, there was one one uh, young lady. Uh, we were all from Big Ten schools. Um, all the guys played softball. We all went to bars together. Uh, there, there's that bar thing again. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, we all had similar, similar interests. So what happened was, it was not something overtly where people said, let's exclude people, but we gravitated together around softball, around Big Ten, around going to bars. So the, and it just happened to be all the guys, right, are in that group. So what happens is this team then is cohesive. This team makes relationship, this team, it makes it easier for you to succeed because you have connections. So as a, as a boss, I think it's important as you look at your organization to see if there are people in the organization that don't have some of those connections, not because they're being excluded, but because they don't have the same links, the things, same things that make it easier for some of us to, to succeed. And I think that's just something that uh, is important for, for managers to think about and be more, I would say, conscious of those efforts. It, the, the main thing is it's for Johnson, it's about having the best team, right? How do we have the best team, the strongest team? And I believe the strongest team is a diverse team. So this is something that we're making sure we're concentrating on and think about for the future. I think maybe related to that point is Johnson Space Center is renowned for it being creative and taking on really hard problems and being able to solve them and come up with creative solutions. How do you sustain that? How do you stimulate that creativity among the team? So first, uh, one of the main things is you think about the, vi the vision of the mission. The missions themselves should uh, really drive creativity. If you think about some of these things we're being asked to do out past the moon, uh, especially with in uh, uh, finding ways to partner with new people and be more innovative. Those missions themselves drive tough choices, drive technology advancements, drive those kind of things. So that's huge. But the other is providing a vision for people and a vision for us to say, okay, we've done things a certain way in the past. We know, we know where the budget is. We know it's important for us to do some incredible things with tight budgets, the way the country is today. And so and we know there's some exciting things to do out there. So how do we challenge ourselves to do those kind of missions uh, with thinking of new ways to partner things? If you think about commercial cargo, which started, I don't know, 10 years ago, 
uh, where we thought, hey, let's go buy some services, have people deliver cargo to the ISS, and it has in fact created a whole new different type of, of entity. SpaceX and Orbital did incredible things in that contract. We've done things on Space Station where we've contracted for uh, services rather than buying specific things, and it's created new companies that are now providing capabilities for uh, onboard ISS. So it's really setting a vision for people to say it's not only not just where we're going, but how we're going to do it can really can create some incredible innovation and some exciting things in the future. So it's really putting that vision out there and then challenging the team. Well, space exploration is a dangerous business. And we know sometimes things don't go the way they're, they're planned and you have to learn from, from challenges and tragedies. Um, I'm wondering, how do you work through the setbacks and tragedies and keep focused on moving forward? So that we, we live or we work in a, uh, we have a dangerous uh, profession in that we do missions that inherently are risky. Um, and there are places where some people have never gone before. We know it's, it's a tough place. So we know that going in, our job is to, is to uh, bound that risk to a reasonable amount and at least make sure we're communicating what we think those risks are so we're, our eyes are wide open about the risks that we're taking. Uh, we need to remember that the crew, um, you know, a lot of us are committed to NASA, but the crew are actually the people that risk their lives, that these are the people that actually put uh, everything on the line to make these missions happen. So it's our job to make sure as I said before, that we understand the risks, we communicate the risk, and we do our best to minimize those risks. But things will happen uh, even with the best of intentions, and we've seen that a few times. I think the best, uh, well, what, what you've seen is, um, you know, it's important to step back, think about what happened, uh, to talk, to, to kind of get our hands around where how we got to that point, think about how we, uh, what we needed to be doing for the future, and then to, to set on the path because those missions are in the end uh, bigger than us, bigger than just NASA. They're really there for the country and the world and so these risks are worth taking. Um, but uh, the, risk, the, the risks are worth taking and we need, to, we need to set our mind to that and then we need to put, out, put in the plan and again make sure when we look back at those we find errors that we made in communication or in uh, understanding and we need to make sure we do everything we can today uh, to minimize those. So we do spend a lot of time talking about lessons learned uh, both in the specific engineering areas but also in how we work with one another, how we draw out uh, uh, people that have different, different opinions to make sure we're hearing all the right opinions before we make decisions. Well you've spoken a little bit about how um, NASA has a new relationship with the commercial sector. Things are not like the way they used to be. And the commercial sector is, is growing and NASA is helping to nurture that. What are your thoughts on what NASA may look like in 10 years as that sector continues to grow and that relationship changes? So I think what we're learning is if you look at, um, uh, we're learning, if you look back in the 60s, early 60s, um, NASA did not build the Mercury space uh, craft either, right? That was built by a com company called McDonald Aircraft. But we had a contract with them and NASA played a huge role in those design efforts because no one else had been to space. NASA did a lot of the testing and we were very much involved in the design choices. Well, we've been flying people to low Earth orbit now for 50 years. So now there are companies, Boeing and SpaceX, that can do a lot of that. They can take the, that previous learning and actually create spacecraft. So NASA doesn't have to be in the middle of the design. And we can kind of set, uh, we can basically buy a service. I want to deliver me these many ham sandwiches and then that now it's deliver me uh, safely uh, a crew of four. So now that's, that's the big change. And the beauty of doing that when you step back and just set a requirement set is the companies can innovate because we're not in the middle of making all the design choices so they can innovate. So you look at these two, let's look at the orbital, actually Northrop Grumman now and the SpaceX designs are very different even though they are both delivering basically trying to meet the same set of requirements. Same with Boeing and SpaceX. You look at their capsules for delivering crew, they look very different. Uh, and again, that allows by us stepping back and just setting a, a, a deliver me this and bring the requirements up a level, it allows the companies to innovate and to do things and create things that 
may not have happened had we been in the middle. Now, NASA's job is now to think out past in deep space, for example, where there is no experience, very little experience. And I mentioned before, when Orion goes out past the moon, that'll be the first time we've had a, a human-designed spacecraft go out past the moon since 1972. So it's been a very long time. And we had very few flights that actually went into deep space. So that's an area where NASA is more heavily involved in the design because we have very little experience. Uh, and someday in the future, that will not be the case. So the idea really is to let NASA explore, NASA drive where there really isn't much experience. And for those areas where we're learning more and more, to start handing it off and for NASA to pull up a little bit and maybe more just define a set of requirements so that companies can innovate within that space. And you're seeing that as we're talking about low Earth orbit and what we're going to do with space station. Actually, that was just my next question was about space station because absolutely there's discussion that's been in the news about eventually these vehicles reach the end of their lives or a, a program transitions in some way and there's some discussion about uh, coming to the end of the period when NASA runs International Space Station. What do you kind of, what do you foresee for ISS beyond the time that NASA manages it? Yeah. So we have, we, so we have this incredible space station um, that uh, now is doing groundbreaking research uh, and technology developments and also really as a, uh, I would say a hub for international leadership. It shows the United States leadership in the world because we're leading this international team around the space station. So again, we flew the first flight in 98. Uh, so now the question is, as we go out past the moon, when would low Earth orbit become more the purview of, let's say, commercial companies as opposed to being driven by NASA? So first point is we as NASA, as the, uh, the public trust, we're going to have requirements in low Earth orbit for quite a while. We're still going to be want to be doing research. We're still going to want to fly astronauts in low Earth orbit to get them ready. You know, if you think about flying to Mars, the first thing you're, you're not going to do is send them to Mars. You're going to want to get them acclimated to space. So you're going to fly them to low Earth orbit for a while. So we're going to have requirements in low Earth orbit for quite a while. But the question is, do we have to be the anchor tenant, or can there be a low Earth orbit capability that we purchase, let's say, uh, to do our work? That's really the question. And so we're studying that now. We've act, the first thing we've done is um, put out a request for studies from companies. And we've asked them, OK, if you, if, if, what do you think the possibilities are in low Earth orbit? What would it help? How would NASA help you create a low Earth orbit economy? And how can NASA get out of the way so it doesn't inhibit you? What would that look like for you? And these companies are starting to give us ideas about what that would look like. So the key is in my mind, is putting together a reasonable, feasible transition plan for where NASA pays for everything to where NASA is one of many customers. And that's really what we're working on now. I think it's, I think it's a great idea. Uh, you'll notice, the, uh, but I think it's the timing. The timing's important because, again, we, we're going to have requirements in low Earth orbit, and we don't want to have a gap. We don't want to have a period where we stop, and then we're hoping somebody launches something. We've got to have a continuity there. So it means, means we have to have a, a rational plan. So as we look to the future, there's a lot of discussion about Gateway and that kind of being the next step. Could you kind of explain to us what is Gateway? Where does that stand? When will we see it begin to happen? So the Gateway, if you think about um, the moon and Mars, again, our long-term plan is to get to Mars. Uh, and in, if you're going to get to Mars, almost assuredly you're going to start, you're going to do missions around the moon. Uh, in many ways, the moon helps us feed forward into Mars. So one, what you want to do, uh, you also, though, want a, a space strategy that has continuity. Uh, and what you can do, what you find out is if you put a, a node, let's say, and what I mean by a node is a, a, a small orbiting uh, capability in a high lunar orbit, it can do it can serve both lunar missions as well as Mars missions. So you try to build a capability that supports both missions. Around the moon, it allows you to observe the moon in all sorts of different phases because it's easy to maneuver. It allows us to reuse things like a like lunar landers because remember on Apollo they go down to the surface, they come up, we throw the whole thing away, right? The crew gets back on the crew module and we threw the limb away. If you have an orbiting platform around the moon, you can actually have the ascent module dock to the gateway. Uh, the crew can get back in Orion and go home, and we can refurb 
refurbish the asset module, clean it up, and use it again. So the gateway allows us to reuse key systems like that. The gateway orbit actually is a terrific orbit too for eventually a Mars transfer vehicle where you would attach it to the gateway, outfit it, check it out, and then send it on to Mars. And then it would come back into that gateway orbit where you could reuse it and the crew would again go back to Earth on Orion. So this gateway to me is a way to really optimize around both missions, both the moon and to Mars. Uh, so that's the idea. And uh, another part of the gateway mission is if you think about any orbiting platform, it needs propulsion, it needs, it needs power, it needs communication. So we've actually, back to your question on commercial, we, we know there's a lot of commercial satellite providers that are uh, in orbit today that uh, allow our comm systems and other things to work. And they create these satellite buses, which is basically the power, the communication, and the propulsion system for all these comm satellites. These big companies uh, build that capability that, hey, what if we synergize with their goals and actually work together to create this bus around the moon because they might be willing to put money in because it, we're helping to advance the state of the art for this solar electric propulsion. So that's what we're trying to do. We say, hey, NASA has a, a requirement for this, uh, for this satellite bus around the moon. We know it has very similar requirements to communication bus satellites. So let's see what we can do to work together where we put some money in, they put some money in, and we create this capability. So not only are we staging around the moon, but we're also staging a new way to work with commercial companies. That's so interesting. I know there's a lot of excitement around that. Um, I do want to take a moment to acknowledge and thank you for your leadership to find a way that Space Center Houston could work with NASA Johnson Space Center on the restoration of the Apollo Mission Operations Control Room. It's a really interesting journey to figure out a way that we could get the funding and make that project happen. Um, so you do have an appreciation for the past. I'm kind of curious as you reflect on uh, coming up in the 50th anniversary of Apollo 11 and the restoration of MOKER, why you feel that's a value to restore MOKER and how that's really going to uh, assist NASA as, as we move into the future. Yeah, that's, so that's a great project. The fact that we're uh, taking the mission control room and turning it back to what, the way it looked in the Apollo missions um, and I appreciate everything you've done and, and the city of Webster and everybody else that was a huge part of that um, to make that happen. And as you said, yeah, we had, some <laughs> we had some agreements we had to work through to get the money transferred. But I think what's great about that is one, one it, uh, I, as I said, I, I was just a, a kid at the time, but the landing meant a lot to me. You know, it's an emotional event and also a, a huge event in the history of the United States. So I think just to, uh, to renovate that building, or to renovate that room, I think is to pay homage to that incredible time in our history. Um, and to bring it back to the actual state that it looked, I think will be huge. It also gives us an opportunity to say, um, you know, it didn't end there, right? This is really phase two, going to the shuttle and then space station. It allows us then to, to tell us, to talk about the journey going forward and how now we're going back to the moon not as a simple uh, uh, going and landing and, and flags, but how we're going to do it in a sustainable manner and go out and pass the moon onto Mars. And so it gives us a chance to talk about that too. Well, Mark, I could just keep asking you questions, but this is so much fun. But um, we, I know we have a number of questions that have been submitted online. And so uh, one of our team members, Elise, is going to convey some of the questions that people have been emailing into you. Is there a process for local libraries or schools to get in touch with NASA about careers in STEM or about, or about promoting space exploration? Would uh, love to see more NASA community outreach. Great, great, great question. So we have an office called the External Relations Office, um, headed by Debbie Condor, who was part of your Women's in Leadership event. Um, and their job, their really job is really to to reach out to organizations about STEM and to uh, give them the resources that we have and to try to partner with them on other events like that. So yeah, just let us know, we can get you in touch. And I wanna make a pitch for Space Center Houston. We are a science learning institution and we welcome people coming here on field trips and participating in our robust education programs as well. Yes, thanks, <laughs> good point, good point. So a follow up to that question is also, what is the greatest need uh, from the public to support the space program? 
greatest need from the public? Well, I would say um, the greatest need for the public would be to, as you, um, hmm, it's probably, probably the key is to, uh, as we dialogue with our elected representatives, it might be to express uh, the importance that you see in the National Space Program, how it benefits your community, because it, you know, I just think of JSC and all the communities around NASA, and I think about a program like Orion, which has hundreds of suppliers across this country that increases the technical capability of hundreds of companies, because when we say we're spending money in on space, all that money is spent on Earth, <laughs> and it's, uh, increasing education and technical prowess of this country and leadership of this country. So uh, in the end, I think that's just showing support with, uh, in, uh, with local representatives. But really, I just the, the public support of NASA is incredible everywhere I go, the excitement and the positive messages that I get when I talk to people. So um, uh, the, the public has been awesome. So as far as that, I think that would be it, my only thought. So we have some important anniversaries coming up. The audience would like to know, is there anything for Apollo 7 or Apollo 8 going on at JSC that the public can attend? Well, we're going to as we're going to have a, um, a panel for Apollo 7 and 8 folks that did Apollo 7 and 8 on November 1st. Now, so I think it will be viewable by the public because um, that'll be big. So I think we're having Walt come and do that. Um, so that'll be exciting. And then we, we have an, we're going to have an open house on October 27th at JSC. So we're going to be inviting the public to come actually on site at the center, a uh, chance to see the, the, the work that we're doing. That particular open house is tied to um, NASA's 60th, which we just passed and the space station's 20th, which we're getting close to. So it's a chance to celebrate. We're having a lot of anniversaries this year. And then of course next year around the Apollo 11, there'll be several events in July. I think I'll just add too, we're also gonna have Apollo 7 astronaut Walt Cunningham here for one of our Thought Leader series on Friday, October 5th. So we invite you all to come back to hear Walt speak at that program. This one is, would you rather send 10 probe missions to Mars or spend one manned mission? Yeah, good question. I would like to send a couple robotic missions and then a manned mission if I got to vote. Yeah, I think the beauty of this current plan that we have our exploration plan is we are working very closely with the science mission director at and the probes that are going now from these robotic probes are actually uh, not only doing scientific exploration, but they're also taking measurements and surveys for getting ready for flying people uh, to Mars. For example, we flew a, a radiation sensor uh, on uh, MSR, which so we can know exactly what the radiation levels are on the surface for when we fly people. Um, and we work with them many times to talk about what would be the most interesting things. Because if you think about flying people to Mars, it's going to be a very challenging mission. Uh, it'll be a long way out. They're going to stay there a while. So you want to land at the coolest place so the folks have the best chance to do the work. Um, but the difference between uh, robots and people is that when you, once we put these people in the right place, they have the human mind, uh, has an incredible ability to adapt and to learn from what we're seeing and to react quickly. And so in, uh, putting people on the surface is gonna be really, really important uh, for us to really learn and to uh, really exploit uh, what, we gonna, what we're gonna see on the surface of Mars. But we need both, we need both. So if you could make one goal for NASA, similar to the 1961 Kennedy speech at Rice, what would that goal be? Uh, if I had one goal, I would I would target a, a a date for a Mars landing. I think that's really important as a stretch goal for us to give us a target uh, that'll push us um, to push us to learn to get the things done we need to get done and to excite this country about going to Mars and taking that next big step. That's what I would do. 
What was your most significant failure and what did it teach you? That one's a little personal. Yeah, my significant <laughs> failure. Wow. Um, I've had a few. Let's see. Most significant. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, well, let me let me do. I'll do both. If that's okay. I had a uh, so personnel. Uh, managing people is the most challenging part of my job. It always has been. Um, I feel like in certain parts there are times when uh, I could definitely be better in mentoring people and helping them uh, do their job better. Um, sometimes in the rush of the, uh, the mission in the crunch of the time, I don't spend enough time to do that. And sometimes uh, that's very important to help lead people. So I think mentoring more and helping people through those difficult choices, I think I could always do better at that. That's what I would say. So to go almost the exact opposite of that, uh, do you have a memory from your time at JSC that makes you smile or laugh? Um, yeah, the laughing is a funny one. Yeah, I think about that one. Smile. I had two. I've had two um, that were really, really fun for me. Um, when we worked Space Station, I started in 94. I thought in 96 that it would all go away. I didn't think it was ever going to fly. And then in 98, when uh, Bob Cabana docked the space shuttle to the node, or docked the node to the FGB, and Bob and uh, Sergey Krikalev floated through the hatch together. And uh, at that time, I'd been working on it for almost five years. That was a really, really fun and exciting moment that we had done something that had actually flown. That was great. Uh, second one was uh, on Orion when uh, we were canceled um, and we had to hold on really by ourselves for a while. And then we survived, and then we flew the flight test in 2014, and the, the mission was almost perfect. It was almost flawless. And when it landed back on the water under three full shoots, I will never forget what that felt like. That was a great, that was a great moment. So those were the two, I would say. So this one is a two-parter. Uh, how does NASA minimize costs to stay within budget and do you ultimately have to stay on that budget? Are you allowed to be a little bit more flexible? Yeah, that's a great question. So, and it's a challenge. It is a challenge. So, uh, two things. What are the techniques for, for containing costs? So one, you have to decide what it is you're trying to buy and be as clear as possible. And then figure out what, what is your number one priority? Because if you say, uh, we talked about creating a com commercial industry. If your goal is to create a commercial industry, then it might be okay if the schedule is a little late, if you're still creating a commercial industry, right? So you might set up a contract that allows companies to innovate and take chances. Uh, and some of that chances may be they don't deliver quite on time, but at least they're building a capability, then then you're getting what you want. So you gotta, what, what exactly is my is my goal? On these big programs uh, where you are trying to do something that's never been done before, let's say create capability that we've never had before, uh, cost is extremely important because our budget is limited. But on the other hand, we go into those projects knowing there are risks. It's very difficult to completely estimate those total costs because no one's done it before. So for those, we. We bound them. We bound the risk as best we can. We make a commitment to our bosses and to, let's say, Congress and the president, what we think that range is. And then we, uh, we are constantly asked to report it. So I think uh, that's a great question because it's a challenge depending on what you want, what are your risks, and how do you manage that. Uh, it can be one of the big challenges uh, of NASA is uh, making sure we're clear on what those constraints are. So our next question, our last one? and our last question, 
is what is the biggest challenge that lies ahead as we go back to the moon and beyond? I think the biggest challenge actually relates to the question you just had. Can we do a lunar exploration plan sustainably? Can we do it within the budget that we've been given? And to do that, what are the strategies we're going to use and what are the risks that we're willing to take, both contractually and otherwise? I think that's going to be the big challenge. If we had all the money in the world, can we go to the moon? Absolutely. We did it and we spent a ton of money and it was incredible. But now the expectations are different. So how do we have a lunar exploration and a Mars exploration plan that's sustainable, that is, that is feasible, allows us to grow a commercial industry and allows us to meet the objectives that we've been given? Great, Mark, please join me in thanking Mark Geyer for joining us this evening. Mark, as always, it is such a pleasure to talk with you. We really appreciate your, appreciate your candor and your willingness to be here and let us pepper you with questions about your life and profession and thoughts and all. Um, it really gives us great insight and even more appreciation for all the work that you do and, and the whole team at NASA Johnson Space Center. So again, thank you for being here this evening. I do want to just remind everyone as we close this evening that uh, we have some more very exciting programs coming up. Um, we just booked actually on October 4th a special screening of a Discovery Channel documentary above and beyond NASA's Journey to Tomorrow. It's a movie by Academy Award winning uh, filmmaker Rory Kennedy. Um, she really is a phenomenal filmmaker, has many, many products, uh, uh, films, uh, documentary films that she's created that will be a special screening here. Rory will be here to introduce the film and to answer questions following that screening. Uh, the following night, October 5th, uh, we'll, as I mentioned earlier, have Walt Cunningham here, uh, Apollo 7 astronaut, and he's gonna be speaking about the golden age of space flight. But please check our website. We have many more uh, fun programs coming up. Also on October 6th, we'll be opening our newest traveling exhibit called Planet Pioneers, which is all about sending humans into deep space exploration. So thank you again for joining us this evening and have a safe drive home. Good night.